You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Hey, it's Jordan. Every once in a while, we have a conversation on this show. It's not quite a big story, but it's an interesting and fascinating approach to an idea. If you were listening last week, when Melissa Duggan was hosting this podcast, you heard a collection of great big stories. Here is one that you didn't hear that is very much worth listening to, especially if you're listening to this while staring at that little device in your hand. Enjoy. Chances are you have one in your hand right now and will be picking it up, putting it down, and keeping it within reach until you fall asleep. Smartphones command a constant presence in most of our lives. Richard Warnica, a business reporter with the Toronto Star, argues those devices we can't seem to distance ourselves from are the new cigarettes. Only this time, our current collective addiction is making us dumber, sadder, and less social. Will we ever quit? Or are we doomed to keep scrolling? I'm Melissa Duggan, and this is The Big Story. Richard Warnica is a business reporter for the Toronto Star. Hi, Richard. Hi, Melissa. Thanks so much for having me. What do smartphones and cigarettes kind of by design have in common? So to me, the thing that that, that brings them together and, and the reason I wanted to write this piece is they are both consumer products that went from essentially not existing. Like cigarettes were around before the turn of the 20th century, but they were an incredibly niche product to being completely ubiquitous. Um, by the mid-1960s, cigarettes were everywhere in Canada, in North America, in Europe. And, and smartphones had a, a similar, if, if much faster, adoption wave. You know, I think we're both old enough to remember when you did your work at a desk phone and everybody had landlines at home. And now that seems like a million years ago. Well over 95% of people who are not senior citizens on a smartphone and even senior citizens now are climbing the adoption curve. So what they have in common to me by design is that they are consumer products that went from essentially non-existent to being entirely integrated into our lives in a way that seems permanent, seems forever, and seems like it could never change, which, as you know, with cigarettes, it did in fact change. So take us back in time to a much different place that most of us only have an idea of from TV and movies. Paint a picture of just how much cigarettes were part of everyday life. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to go back that far. I'm, I'm 42, and I'm old enough to remember when you could smoke on international flights in Canada. But if you go back, you know, 30, 40 years, you could smoke literally everywhere. You could smoke in hospital waiting rooms. You smoked in malls. You smoked in movie theaters. You know, I, I say in the piece that cigarettes were the thing you did after a meal. They were the thing you did after work. They were thing, if you were Guy Lafleur, that you did in between periods at a hockey game. Until the late 1990s is when you started to see cigarettes being banned from public places. And that's when you see them essentially start to disappear from public life. You know, when I started university, I was 18 and in Calgary and smoking was everywhere inside. It, you would never go to a bar and not think you're going to come home stinking of smoke. By the time I graduated, smoking indoors had essentially become like degenerate behavior. So what changed? The change, I think, you go back to the 1960s is when the rates start to fall. And historically, what always gets looked at is this 1965 Surgeon General's report in the U.S. where they come out and say, unequivocally, cigarettes are linked to cancer. I didn't get into the piece, but as a quirk of history, the Canada's health minister had actually come out a year before that with a very similar warning. But either way, from that point, cigarette usage starts to gradually drop basically against a decades-long rearguard action by the tobacco industry to say, first of all, cigarettes aren't that bad for you. Second of all, if they are that bad for you, it's consumer choice. Consumers can make up their own mind. And then beginning in the 1990s, you start having all these whistleblower accounts coming out about how extensive the tobacco industry's knowledge of the addictive qualities of cigarettes and nicotine in particular were 
And that's when you start to see the tobacco industry losing mass lawsuits and really going away as an everyday integrated part of life as opposed to a niche product. Flash forward to now, as you write in this piece, how are smartphones considered the new cigarettes? Obviously, there's no one-to-one correlation in terms of health negative effects. Using your smartphone is not going to give you lung cancer in the same way there is the direct one-to-one correlation that cigarettes will overwhelmingly likely to take decades off your life. To me, the connection is it is something that, you know, when used massively, there is growing evidence that it is not good, right? Especially for children. And, And we're seeing studies now coming out with unbelievable correlations on children's mental health starting in 2012, starts falling off a cliff. And, you know, the first lesson in social science is I've got a political science degree and what they teach you on day one is correlation does not equal causation. But when you look at the correlations between the dramatic drop in children's mental health, children's reading scores, children's test scores from the mass introduction of smartphones, we would be looking at the most incredible coincidence in social science history if these two things are not linked. But what's interesting to me is, like with cigarettes, when the initial focus is, this is bad for youth, we need to get young people to stop smoking. You know, I was eight or nine, 10, something like that, when 16-year-olds stopped being allowed to buy cigarettes in Canada. You have a more gradual realization that it is not good for grownups either. And this is where we're a little more out into the, the qualitative part of the argument. We don't have as much scientific data because it hasn't been as studied. But to me, from a living in the world point of view, I think the mass use of smartphones has made us worse readers, has made us less social, has made us more linked to a technology that creates a facade of sociability and socialization. And it is increasingly replacing actual socialization. And something you focus on in your piece, too, is the smartphone itself. Whereas most times we blame this addiction to our device on social media giants, you know, this feed that they create for us. We get these rewards. We can't stop looking at it. Why do you think that the phone makers themselves have mostly been absent from the discussion? That is a fascinating question, because if you look right now, there are major lawsuits by states in the United States right now that are being deliberately set up to mimic the major suits against the tobacco producers against companies like Meta, saying that they have created products in Instagram, less and less so, but Facebook, that are deliberately targeting teens and young people with addictive qualities. To me, and the argument I make in the piece, and the analogy I make in the piece is that, okay, well, if social media is the nicotine, then the phone is the cigarette. It is the device that creates the possibility to have constant access. And without the phone, the apps do not have constant flow into your home, into your life, on the bus, on the toilet, wherever you are. And I think that this is, again, this is me as an opinion writer opining on this, I think we will start to see some of that focus shift to, okay, you can make one app maker make something less deliberately addictive, less targeted to children. Don't we think that something else is going to take its place as long as we are all in agreement that we have to carry a weapon of mass distraction around with us 18 hours a day? Are we able to define smartphone addiction compared to smartphone use? I don't know, frankly. I mean, I think there's there's probably various uh, academic definitions. I'll say that there are obviously in any sort of curve case of addictive behavior and troubling behavior, there are people who are so far off one end that it is incredibly clear they need special intervention. And then you tend to have this whole big curve. You can almost think of it as like severe alcoholics versus problem drinkers. And I think we're in a similar sort of curve with smartphones. I think you have people who are You know, I'm not a doctor. I don't know how to define addiction in this case, but there are probably people whose behavior would be discussed as being medically addictive. And then I think you have a whole much larger body of people who would be considered problem users based on that constant need, almost like that need to to get a smoke, right? You're sitting on 
too long in a meeting, you're on an airplane, you start feeling that twitch like you need a, you need a butt. That feeling now of, oh my God, I haven't checked my notifications. Is my phone buzzing in my pocket? That's a symbol to me of some level of problematic use. Like I'm thinking about picking up my phone sometimes and opening it up and starting to scroll and not even realizing I'm doing it. There isn't even anything I'm really looking for. So what is it about this thing that makes us want to have it on us at all times next to our bed? in our pocket. I mean, walking down the street and have to have it in our hands. There are a lot of interesting studies about what the sort of dopamine release of getting a notification on Twitter or a like on Instagram or even an email, just that constant feedback loop of something new. And and I think we all recognize it in ourselves. Like I will pick up my phone to text my wife about what we need from the grocery store And 45 minutes later, realized that I've been watching reels of like German dance and basketball highlights and never have texted my wife. And will put my phone down, think about what I was trying to do, and then think, oh, I wonder if someone has liked my tweet about my story about smartphone addiction. I better pick up my smartphone to check. So I, I, I started my first like real reporting job in 2006 at the Edmonton Journal. And I can remember going to brunch with the other intern reporters one morning. And it was the first time anyone I had ever seen made a call on their cell phone while we were sitting at the table. And it struck me as like the most antisocial thing I had ever seen. I couldn't believe that someone had done that. And within a couple of years, like the idea of not checking your phone at the table would come to seem weird. Like if you don't routinely take out your phone, take a picture, take a picture of your friends, text your friends to make sure everything is good at home. Like, you're almost much stranger if you were like, oh, I didn't bring my phone tonight. So smartphone addiction can um, have some negative consequences, but we need them, right? Like, we have to have it to perform our job. So won't phasing it out be so difficult? Yeah, and, and I don't think, I say this in the piece, smartphones aren't going away. Right. We're not going to go back to a place where nobody has a smartphone. I do think we can look at ways to change the industrial design to perhaps make it less habit forming. Or maybe we change social norms a little bit to make it, you know, less okay to be pulling out your phone all the time. I don't really know how you do that. The one thing I would say is yes, for a lot of our job functions, we do need a phone. Do we need a phone? that is also a video camera and a gambling app and access to all of these different things. Like functionally, how much worse at your job would you be if you had a 90s flip phone and had to call people every time? Like I have an iPhone that the Toronto Star has given me and tons of functional use for it in my job. But also it's like my work has given me a toy that I play with for like 12 hours a day. So yeah, I can reply to my work emails. I can send out a work Twitter. But also like, I'll be like, ah, I got to write this news story. And then an hour and a half later, I've been scrolling through like tweets about something completely unrelated to my job. I think they do have a lot of positives. You know, I talk about in the piece, my 76-year-old mother has a smartphone now and we got it for her for Christmas so she can FaceTime my daughter from three provinces away And they have a different relationship because they talk to each other on the screen. And I think that's beautiful. I do think that when we look at changing behavior, we do probably have to start with youth and start with, okay, what age are we introducing this technology? What functionality are we giving to youth when we are introducing this technology? How are we governing that use in schools? Are we likely to see anything like that 1965 Surgeon General announcement you talk about in your piece, but this time for smartphones? Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, it's such a different kind of technology. I think everybody already recognizes that it's not great to spend six or seven hours a day on these devices. But it's a lot different than having someone come out and say, you know, smoking a pack of these a day is going to kill you and it's also going to harm the people around you. 
I think we're more likely to see like a gradual sea change, perhaps, in use than we would a specific moment in culture where one thing is tied to the beginning of a decline. What I thought was so fascinating about your piece is how you talked about when we're in the middle of something, it seems like change won't happen. You know, that we'll never get rid of cigarettes. And now we're thinking we'll never get rid of smartphones. I wonder how you start to inch toward that change and how, I don't know, how we just kind of our human condition that just thinks the situation we're in right now is just never going to be any different. That's the sort of intellectual exercise I found fascinating about the piece is to think about how does something that's everywhere go away and, and why? And if you remember back to, to cigarettes, it wasn't like people accepted, oh, okay, we can't smoke indoors anymore. The restaurant and bar industry fought that forever. They were fighting it into my 20s. You know, Calgary, where I'm from, outlawed smoking on patios before smoking indoors because bars were so convinced that if you barred smokers, no one would come to drink at their establishments anymore. I'm skeptical of mass change occurring because people decide to change their behavior en masse. But I do think the first step will be changing realizations about what is possible for kids. Like, there's this debate in Ontario right now about barring smartphone use in class. And the counterargument has always been, well, we don't want to bar it. We want to teach them responsible use. But where are they learning responsible use for? I think about this all the time. I've got a six-year-old. I'm certainly not showing her responsible use. So I tend to more come down when it comes to schooling anyway, on bans, on get them out of the classrooms. And maybe even we need to push forward to get them off the campuses. Don't bring your phone to school at all and, and give kids at least that eight-hour window where their brains are interacting with real people and real material in front of them. You know, at one point they talked about, you know, if you could, you could quit smoking, it's a personal choice. But there are these addictive qualities that make it so it's not a choice. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it's the smartphone industry has been very clear about modeling their technology on slot machines and, and video lottery terminals and, and targeting the same brain physiology that is targeted with those incredibly addictive technologies. And I, I always think back to, um, I'm talking a lot about Calgary today, I don't know why, but going to like a, like a neighborhood pub when I was probably in high school, it was pretty easy to get a beer in a neighborhood pub as a teenager back then. But like seeing one of my friend's moms at one of these video lottery terminals and just like plugging money into it for like four hours the whole time I was there and just that kind of blank look in her face and just feeling like so depressed by that. And I feel like I see that same blank look everywhere now on people on their phones. And I see it on myself. Do you know what I mean? Like I actually, I bought like a cash box and I'm looking at it right now that I'm trying to just stick my phone in when my kid gets home now because I've realized if I have it on me, no matter how much I intend to be like, I'm not going to look at that during dinner. I'm not going to look at that while my kid is showing me her drawing. I'm going to look at it. Unless I physically put a barrier in place, I'm going to look at it. The, I've, been, I've been trying my best not to look at my phone while I'm talking to you about not looking at phones, and I'm losing that battle. I'm kind of dabbling in yoga right now, and the instructor will lecture the class at the beginning of every session about putting their phones away. And I don't see her, you know, stopping that lecture anytime soon. I wonder what might be a first solid step towards curbing our phone addiction. A good question. I mean, you know, I, I think that's part of why I have actually gotten really into yoga and Pilates in part because it's like an hour where I am forcibly removed from it. Hey, look at us. Yeah, I know. Uh, but I find like I, I, I finished that and I'm not just physically feeling better. I'm mentally feeling better as well. I do find like the lockbox helps me. If I, if I put that in there at 6 p.m., I may unlock it and check it two or three times before bed. But if I don't, I'm probably checking it 
30, 40, 50, 60 times before bed and then probably taking it to bed with me. And then I'm in bed and rather than reading a book and actually learning something, I'm looking at nonsense for an hour and a half and wondering what happened to my brain. Do you really see a future where we'll be putting these down? I don't know. I mean, I really hope part of this piece was written at out, right? Part of it for me is, again, like I have a six-year-old girl and my hope is that when she's a teenager and she's in her 20s, they will look at how we use smartphones the way teens today look at how people smoked 20 years earlier. And they're like, I cannot believe that you had it with you everywhere and spent six or seven hours a day. Whether that happens, I I genuinely don't know. I hope it does. Thanks for that, Richard. Thank you. Richard Warnica is a business reporter for the Toronto Star. That was The Big Story. For more, visit thebigstorypodcast.ca. Feedback is warmly welcome, and we would like to hear your suggestions for future episodes. You can always email us at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or call us at 416-935-5935. The Big Story Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Like us, rate us, review us, share us with a friend. Thanks for listening. I'm Melissa Duggan, in for Jordan Heath-Rawlings.